Hi gamers! This episode is gonna be all about codexes, so if you're not into this part of the, uh, the Mass Effect story, then you can freely ignore this episode entirely. If you're still here, rest assured I'm not gonna be reading it to you. I'm leaving that to our narrator, Neil Ross. I'm only gonna cover the entries that are voiced. And as a backdrop, I'll be doing some mining. There's tons of stuff that needs to be upgraded, you know. So, without further ado, here's episode 14. Enjoy! The Asari were the first species to discover the citadel. When the Salarians arrived, it was the Asari who proposed the establishment of the Citadel Council to maintain peace throughout the galaxy. Since then, the Asari have served as the mediators and centrists of the Council. An all-female race, the Asari reproduce through a form of parthenogenesis. They can attune their nervous system to that of another individual of any gender and of any species to reproduce. This capability has led to the unseemly and inaccurate rumors about Asari promiscuity. Asari can live for over a thousand years, passing through three stages of life. In the maiden stage, they wander restlessly, seeking new knowledge and experience. When the matron stage begins, they meld with interesting partners to produce their offspring. This ends when they reach the matriarch stage, where they assume the roles of leaders and counselors. The second species to join the citadel, the Salarians are warm-blooded amphibians with a hyperactive metabolism. Salarians think fast, talk fast, and move fast. To Salarians, other species seem sluggish and dull-witted. Unfortunately, their metabolic speed leaves them with a relatively short lifespan. Salarians over the age of 40 are a rarity. The Salarians were responsible for advancing the development of the primitive Krogan species to use as soldiers during the Rachni Wars. They were also behind the creation of the genophage bioweapon the Turians used to quell the Krogan rebellion several centuries later. Salarians are known for their observational capability and non-linear thinking. This manifests as an aptitude for research and espionage. They are constantly experimenting and inventing and it is generally accepted that they always know more than they are letting on. Roughly 1,200 years ago, the Turians were invited to join the Citadel Council to fulfill the role of galactic peacekeepers. The Turians have the largest fleet in Citadel space, and they make up the single largest portion of the Council's military forces. As their territory and influence has spread, the Turians have come to rely on the Salarians for military intelligence and the Asari for diplomacy. Despite a somewhat colonial attitude towards the rest of the galaxy, the ruling hierarchy understands they would lose more than they would gain if the other two races were ever removed. Turians come from an autocratic society that values discipline and possesses a strong sense of personal and collective honor. There is lingering animosity between Turians and humans over the First Contact War of 2157, which is known as the Relay 314 incident to the Turians. Officially, however, the two species are allies, and they enjoy civil, if cool, diplomatic relations. In the early 2160s, the Alliance began aggressive colonization of worlds in the Skillian Verge, much to the dismay of the Batarians, who had been developing the region for several decades. In 2171, the Batarians petitioned the Council to declare the Verge a zone of Batarian interest. The Council refused, however, declaring unsettled worlds in the region open to human colonization. In protest, the Batarians closed their Citadel Embassy and severed official diplomatic relations with the Council, effectively becoming a rogue state. They instigated a proxy war in the Verge by funneling money and weapons to criminal organizations, urging them to strike at human colonies. Hostilities peaked with the Skillian Blitz of 2176, an attack on the human capital of Elysium by Batarian-funded pirates and slavers. In 2178, the Alliance retaliated with a crushing assault on the moon of Torfin, long used as a staging base by Batarian-backed criminals. 
In the aftermath, the Batarians retreated into their own systems and are now rarely seen in Citadel space. Living beyond the Omega-4 mass relay in the Terminus systems, the mysterious collector species is glimpsed so rarely as to be taken for a myth by most in galactic society. In reality, collectors are human-sized insectoid bipeds and can resemble massive winged beetles. They are a terrifying force in the galaxy, responsible for the murder of hundreds of thousands. Collectors generate permanent stasis fields around themselves, creating nightmarish red-shifted energy fields. In battle, they hold position whenever possible, relying on their aggressive biotics and nearly limitless power. Several types of bipedal collectors have been identified, including minions, defenders, zealots, assassins, and artillery operators. Acting together, collectors have imprisoned entire cities in stasis. While no definite forensic accounting exists to explain the fate of those imprisoned, Leading speculation is that victims are harvested for scientific experimentation and neurobiological repurposing. The Elcor are a citadel species native to the high gravity world Dakuna. They are massive creatures standing on four muscular legs for increased stability. Elcor move slowly, an evolved response to an environment where a fall can be lethal. This has colored their psychology, making them deliberate and conservative. Elcor's speech is ponderous and monotone. Among themselves, scent, slight movements, and subvocalized infrasound convey shades of meaning that make a human smile seem as subtle as a fireworks display. Since their subtlety can lead to misunderstandings with other species, the Elcor often go out of their way to clarify when they are being sarcastic, amused, or angry. Dakuna's high gravity impedes mountain formation. Most of the world consists of flat, open plains, which prehistoric Elcor wandered across in small family bands. Modern Elcor still prefer open sky and can become restless and uncomfortable on long starship journeys. The Geth are a humanoid race of networked AIs. They were created by the Quarians 300 years ago as tools of labor and war. When the Geth showed signs of self-evolution, the Quarians attempted to exterminate them. The Geth won the resulting war. This example has led to legal, systematic repression of artificial intelligences in galactic society. The Geth possess a unique distributed intelligence. An individual has rudimentary animal instincts, but as their numbers and proximity increase, the apparent intelligence of each individual improves. In groups, they can reason, analyze situations, and use tactics, as well as any organic race. Geth's space is located at the trailing end of the Perseus arm, beyond the lawless Terminus systems. The Perseus Veil, an obscuring dark nebula of opaque gas and dust, lies between their space and the Terminus systems. Anar are a citadel species known for excessive politeness, they speak with scrupulous precision and take offense at improper language. Hanar that expect to deal with other species take special courses to help them unlearn their tendency to take offense at improper speech. All Hanar have two names. The face name is known to the world. The soul name is kept for use among close friends and relations. Hanar never refer to themselves in the first person in conversation with someone they know on a face name basis. To do so is considered egotistical, so instead they refer to themselves as this one, or the impersonal it. Their homeworld, Kajay, has 90% ocean cover and orbits an energetic white star, resulting in a permanent blanket of cloud. Due to the presence of Prothean ruins on the world, many Hanar worship them, and Hanar myths often speak of an elder race that civilized them by teaching them language. The Krogan evolved in a hostile and vicious environment. Until the invention of gunpowder weapons, eaten by predators was still the number one cause of Krogan fatalities. Afterwards, it was death by gunshot. When the Salarians discovered them, the Krogan were a brutal, primitive species, struggling to survive a self-inflicted nuclear winter. 
The Salarians culturally uplifted them, teaching them to use and build modern technology so they could serve as soldiers in the Rachni War. Liberated from the harsh conditions of their homeworld, the quick breeding Krogan experienced an unprecedented population explosion. They began to colonize nearby worlds. Even though these worlds were already inhabited, the Krogan rebellions lasted nearly a century, only ending when the Turians unleashed the Genophage, a Salarian developed bioweapon that crushed all Krogan resistance. The Genophage makes only one in a thousand pregnancies viable, and today the Krogan are a slowly dying breed. Hovering tanks resembling a cross between an octopus and a giant crab, Praetorians are well-armored killing machines of mysterious origin. Praetorians employ redundant systems from the multiple humans encased within them. Armed with eye-mounted particle beams and capable of attacks at close range, they teleport to evade attack while regenerating their shields. Within hours after death, the organic components of Praetorian corpses disintegrate into a denatured pus while their mechanisms turn to ash. One specimen, autopsied within minutes of death, reveals a clue. Nanomachines may disintegrate the Praetorian's organic and mechanical components before self-destructing. If correct, this self-rendering hypothesis could account for three documented cases of dead Praetorians apparently releasing, or becoming, clouds of neurotoxic gases, causing suffocating paralysis and nearly instant death. In one remote facility, 17 soldiers died from gas inhalation while assessing the Praetorian. Any personnel in the vicinity of dead Praetorians are urged to protect themselves with breathing apparatus. Driven from their home system by the Geth nearly three centuries ago, most Quarians now live aboard the migrant fleet, a flotilla of 50,000 vessels ranging in size from passenger shuttles to mobile space stations. Home to 17 million Quarians, the flotilla understandably has scarce resources. Because of this, each Quarian must go on a rite of passage known as the pilgrimage when they come of age. They leave the fleet and only return once they have found something of value they can bring back to their people. Other species tend to look down on the Quarians for creating the Geth and for the negative impact their fleet has when it enters a system. This has led to many myths and rumors about the Quarians, including the belief that underneath their clothes and breathing masks, they are actually cybernetic creatures, a combination of organic and synthetic parts. A myth common to several cultures in the galaxy, Reapers were imagined to be space monsters who consumed entire stars. Archaeologists and mythologists attempting to uncover sources for such myths have yielded little except interstellar religious themes of all-consuming devils common to primitive cultures. The Volus are a member species of the Citadel with their own embassy, but they are also a client race of the Turians. Centuries ago, they were voluntarily absorbed into the hierarchy, effectively trading their mercantile prowess for Turian military protection. Erun, their homeworld, lies far beyond the normal life zone of its star. However, the world has a high-pressure greenhouse atmosphere that traps enough heat to support an ammonia-based biochemistry. As a result, the Volus must wear pressure suits and breathers when dealing with other species, as conventional nitrogen-oxygen-air mixtures are poisonous to them, and in the low-pressure atmospheres tolerable to most species, their flesh will actually split open. Volus culture is tribal, bartering lands and even people to gain status. This culture of exchange inclines them to economic pursuits. It was the Volus who authored the Unified Banking Act, and they continue to monitor and balance the Citadel economy. Although they resemble a mammal-reptile cross, the Vorcha have no terrestrial analog. They are humanoid in form, but Vorcha have clusters of non-differentiated neoblast cells, like those of Earth's planarian worms. Damaged Vorcha cells mature into specialized structures to alleviate injury or stress. Transformations include thicker skin following injury, lung adaptation for barely breathable atmospheres, and stronger cardioskeletal muscle under high gravity. Skull capacity and brain size do not change, and Vorcha rarely make more than one somatic overhaul. 
Vorcha assault each other frequently, causing their young to gain strength, intelligence, and resilience. As a result, Vorcha see inflicting and receiving pain as normal communication. Few Vorcha study professions, in part because their average life expectancy is only 20 years. Because Vorcha can eat and breathe nearly anything, they can live almost anywhere. But racism prevents them from integrating into most societies that dismiss them as vermin. They have few employment options beyond Krogan mercenary bands. 50,000 years ago, the Protheans were the only spacefaring species in the galaxy. They vanished in a swift galactic extinction. Only the legacy of their empire remains. They are believed to have built the mass relays and the citadel, which have allowed numerous species to explore and expand throughout the galaxy. Prothean ruins are found on worlds across the galaxy. While surprisingly intact for their age, functioning examples of Prothean paleotechnology are rare. Time and generations of looters have picked their dead cities and derelict stations clean. Some believe the Protheans meddled in the evolution of younger races. The Hanar homeworld of Kaje, for example, shows clear evidence of former Prothean occupation. The presence of a former Prothean observation post on Mars has caused a rebirth of interventionary evolutionists among humans. These individuals believe the god myths of ancient civilizations are misremembered encounters with aliens. The Citadel is an ancient deep space station, presumably constructed by the Protheans. Since the Prothean extinction, numerous species have come to call the Citadel home. It serves as the political, cultural, and financial capital of the galactic community. To represent their interests, most species maintain embassies on the Presidium, the Citadel's inner ring. The Citadel Tower in the center of the Presidium holds the Citadel Council Chambers. Council affairs often have far-reaching effects on the rest of the galactic community. Five arms, known as the wards, extend from the Presidium. Their inner surfaces have been built into cities, populated by millions of inhabitants from across the galaxy. The Citadel is virtually indestructible. If attacked, the station can close its arms to form a solid, impregnable shell. For as long as the station has existed, an enigmatic race called the Keepers has maintained it. Spectres are agents from the Office of Special Tactics and Reconnaissance and answer only to the Citadel Council. They are elite military operatives, granted the authority to deal with threats to peace and stability in whatever way they deem necessary. They operate independently or in groups of two or three. Some are empathetic peacekeepers, resolving disputes through diplomacy. Others are cold-blooded assassins, ruthlessly dispatching problem individuals. All get the job done one way or another, often operating outside the bounds of galactic law. The Spectres were founded after the Salarians joined the Council. For many years, they operated in secrecy as backroom problem solvers. Only after the Krogan rebellions did their activities become publicized. Assignment of a Spectre is less contentious than a military deployment, but makes it clear that the Council is concerned about a situation. A political economic pact for collective colonial security, the Alliance is the central galactic institution of human society. The Alliance gained associate membership to the Citadel Council in 2165 and full membership in 2183 with Ambassador David Anderson representing humanity. Human political economic relationships vary between combative and lucrative. The Turians, who'd fought humans during the 2157 First Contact War, have become valuable trade partners despite residual social hostility. Other relationships are even more complicated. The rapid rise of human political influence on the Council, achieving in decades what others waited or are still waiting centuries to acquire, has galvanized suspicion and resentment against humanity. That negativity is vastly outweighed by the respect and trust humanity earned by saving the Council during the 2183 attack on the Citadel, at the cost of Alliance cruisers Cairo, Cape Town, Emden, Jakarta, Madrid, Seoul, Shenyang, and Warsaw, and their 2,400 crew. Immediately following the first contact war, an anonymous extranet manifesto warned that an alien attempt at human genocide was inevitable. The manifesto called for an army, 
a Cerberus to guard against invasion through the Charon Relay. Derided as survivalist rhetoric written by an elusive man, the manifesto and its anonymous author soon fell off the media radar. But in 2165, terrorists stole antimatter from the SSV Geneva. The sole figure arrested named his sponsor Cerberus. Throughout the 2160s and 2170s, alleged Cerberus agents assassinated politicians, sabotaged starships bearing Ezo, and conducted nightmarish experiments on aliens and humans. Denounced as human supremacist, Cerberus calls itself human survivalist. Counter-terror experts speculate Cerberus may have changed leadership with its recent shift to stockpiling ships, agents, and weapons. Whether he, she, or they, the elusive man hides his finances hidden behind shell companies. Few doubt he will kill anyone attempting to expose him. The reclusive tycoon calling himself the elusive man is a human nationalist focused on advancing human interests, whatever the cost to non-humans. The Citadel Council regards him as a fanatic, posing a serious threat to galactic security. A mysterious maverick, to say the least, the elusive man heads the Cerberus network. Dubbed the elusive empire by investigators, Cerberus is an allegedly untraceable syndicate of private intelligence agencies, biotics laboratories, engineering and scientific research teams, and lucrative front companies. Branded a terrorist and seditionist organization by authorities, Cerberus is the only human power base other than the Terra Firma party, strong enough to embarrass, if not threaten, the Council and its human representatives. Founded by notorious Batarian slaver Solom Dalsera, the Blue Suns began as a Skillian Verge protection racket, providing genuine protection from slavers and pirates. Eventually captured by the Systems Alliance Navy, Dalsera beat almost two dozen charges to be convicted on a single count of conspiracy. The slaver benefited from the tutelage of cellmate and brilliant con artist Bernard Legitz Ledger. Upon release five years later, Dalsera incorporated Blue Suns as a legal security agency. Today, the Blue Suns boast a galaxy-wide force of Batarians, Turians, Humans, and Krogan. Each deployment is backed by a logistics core, selling everything from heavy weapons to shaving cream. Despite claims that Blue Suns sells its captives as slaves, no Blue Suns employee has ever been convicted on such charges. Many Blue Suns members sport the company logo in tattoo form, removed during assignments and reapplied at mission end. Freedom's Progress Colony was once a typical Alliance settlement, but following complete communications blackout and its apparent destruction is now a lightning rod for anxiety and dread in the galactic human community. The communications blackout followed an upgrade of the colony's small military force, supplemented by mechs and security drones, with high-powered tower-mounted guardian lasers. Colonists complained about construction cost overruns, delays, noise, and damage to the local environment. They also feared the defense array could be seen as provocative to their world's neighbors. Such fears may not have been baseless. Authorities have still offered no explanation for the communications blackout, fueling rumors of plagues, natural disasters, or a cult-inspired mass suicide. Located in strategically insignificant space, Freedom's Progress Colony had once offered residents spectacular rainbows, lush marshlands, and stunning mountain ranges. Its potential as an agricultural settlement and tourism wonderland rivaled that of any Alliance colony. A typical Terminus colony possessing minimal tourist value, Horizon promises substantial economic opportunity, especially in providing new products for humans and supplying the Turian hierarchy. Surveyed 18 years ago, Horizon received pilot habitation four years later. The colony proper is now eight years old. Blessed with verdant forests and abundant fresh water, Horizon maintains a colonial culture that thrives as a refuge from the increasing restrictions of Citadel-governed society. Horizon has attracted numerous dissidents, marginal people, and fringe dwellers from across Alliance space. Known as the Starcraft Cemetery, Corliss was the regional toxic junkyard for centuries. 
Ships reaching astronautical near death at connecting mass relays were sent to Corliss. Stripped of every useful component, then dumped planetward to clear shipping lanes. Currently, Corliss hosts numerous Merc factions, such as the Blue Suns, rumored to be using downed ship fossils to test advanced munitions. Massive gun batteries threaten anyone attempting planetfall, with minimal defenses against ground attack. Because ancient volcanism greenhoused the planet, Corliss was too hot and CO2 rich to develop a biosphere, despite the abundant lakes that could have sponsored the development of life. Now cool enough for protected habitation, but too scorching for anyone but extremophiles and mercenaries seeking secrecy, Corliss supports numerous Krogan outposts. The Krogan have therefore seeded Corliss with hardy Varen, often kept as warhounds. Varen live primarily on a diet of geophagus vermin and each other. Originally an asteroid rich in element zero, Omega was briefly mined by the Protheans, who eventually abandoned it due to its thick, impenetrable crust. Thousands of years later, nature did what even the Protheans could not. A collision with another asteroid broke Omega in half, exposing its trove of element zero for easy mining. A rush ensued as corporations and private individuals tried to strike it rich on Omega, and thieves and outlaws followed in their wake. As space became tight, construction of processing facilities extended vertically from the asteroid, creating Omega's jellyfish-like silhouette. To prevent future collisions, the station is ringed with enormous mass effect field generators that redirect incoming debris. Today, Omega is a major hub of narcotics, weapons, and ESO trafficking without even a pretense of civilian government or military control. Only mercenary groups have been able to instill a limited order. The most ruthless is an Asari syndicate run by the notorious Arya Talok. The Systems Alliance space vehicle Normandy is a prototype starship created as a joint human and Turian venture. A frigate optimized for reconnaissance missions, the vessel uses state-of-the-art stealth technology. Most ships generate tremendous heat that is easily detectable against the absolute zero background of space. The Normandy, however, temporarily sinks this heat within its hull. Because of exterior hull refrigeration, the ship can travel undetected for hours or drift passively for days of covert observation. That heat sinking carries the risk of cooking the crew alive if the stored heat is not eventually radiated. Also contributing to stealth, is the Normandy's revolutionary Tantalus Drive, a Mass Effect core double the standard size. The Tantalus generates mass concentrations that the Normandy falls into, allowing it to move without the use of heat-emitting thrusters. With elaborate secrecy, Cerberus labored for years to build a new, superior Normandy. The vehicle's many alterations produced a craft nearly double the original size requiring an even larger Tantalus drive core to compensate. The new Normandy features greater space in living quarters, research laboratory, observation deck, and cargo bay. Its shuttle can make landings the Normandy cannot attempt. In addition to tight beam communicators, Normandy's quantum entanglement communicator, QEC, provides instantaneous contact with the elusive man. The Enhanced Defense Intelligence, AI, coordinates many of the ship's combat functions, assisting and even supplanting human piloting. Potential upgrades are numerous. The airframe could support additional armor and an axial mass accelerator. The thrusters could support recent advances in fuel technology beyond H2O2 chemical rockets. And the hull can mount double the standard number of kinetic barrier projectors, leaving space for stronger shields, easily sustainable via the new ESO drive core. Biotics is the ability of rare individuals to manipulate dark energy and create mass effect fields through the use of electrical impulses from the brain. Intense training and surgically implanted amplifiers are necessary for a biotic to produce mass effect fields powerful enough for practical use. The relative strength of biotic abilities varies greatly among species and with each individual. There are three branches of biotics, 
Telekinesis uses mass lowering fields to levitate or impel objects. Mass raising kinetic fields are used to block or pin objects. Spatial distortion uses rapidly shifting mass fields to shred objects. Most organic species are capable of developing biotic abilities, though there are risks involved. Biotics are the result of an in utero exposure to element zero. This usually causes fatal cancers in the victim, but in rare cases, it coalesces into nodules within the fetus's developing nervous system. Element zero can increase or decrease the mass of a volume of space-time when subjected to an electrical current. When subjected to an electrical current, the rare material dubbed element zero, or ESO, emits a dark energy field that raises or lowers the mass of all objects within it. This mass effect is used in countless ways, from generating artificial gravity to manufacturing high-strength construction materials. It is most prominently used to enable faster-than-light space travel. ESO is generated when solid matter, such as a planet, is affected by the energy of a star going supernova. The material is common in the asteroid debris that orbits neutron stars and pulsars. These are dangerous places to mine, requiring extensive use of robotics, telepresence, and shielding to survive the incredible radiation from the dead star. Only a few major corporations can afford the setup costs required to work these primary sources. Humanity discovered refined element zero at the Prothean Research Station on Mars, allowing them to create mass effect fields and develop FTL travel. Element zero can increase or decrease the mass of a volume of space time when subjected to an electrical current. With a positive current, mass is increased. With a negative current, mass is decreased. The stronger the current, the greater the magnitude of the dark energy mass effect. In space, low mass fields allow FTL travel and inexpensive surface to orbit transit. High mass fields create artificial gravity and push space debris away from vessels. In manufacturing, low mass fields permit the creation of evenly blended alloys, while high mass compaction creates dense, sturdy construction materials. The military makes extensive use of mobility-enhancing technologies, with mass effect utilizing fighting vehicles standard frontline issue in most military forces. Mass effect fields are also essential in the creation of kinetic barriers or shields to protect against enemy fire. Mass relays are feats of Prothean engineering advanced far beyond the technology of any living species. They are enormous structures scattered throughout the stars and can create corridors of virtually mass-free space, allowing instantaneous transit between locations separated by years or even centuries of travel using conventional FTL drives. Primary mass relays can propel ships thousands of light years, often from one spiral arm of the galaxy to another. However, they have fixed one-to-one -one connections a primary relay connects to one other primary relay and nowhere else. Secondary relays can only propel ships across a few hundred light years. However, they are omnidirectional. A secondary relay can send a ship to any other relay within its limited range. There are many dormant primary relays whose corresponding twins have not yet been located. These are left inactive until their partner is charted as established civilizations are unwilling to blindly open a passage that might connect them to a hostile species. Omni-tools are handheld devices that combine a computer microframe, sensor analysis pack, and mini-factoring fabricator. Versatile and reliable, an Omni-tool can be used to analyze and adjust the functionality of most standard equipment, including weapons and armor, from a distance. The fabrication module can rapidly assemble small three-dimensional objects from common reusable industrial plastics, ceramics, and light alloys. This allows for field repairs and modifications to most standard items, as well as the reuse of salvaged equipment. Omni-tools are standard issue for soldiers and first-in colonists. The collector's particle beam weapon is strangely crafted 
possessing few moving parts, lacking any obvious means for disassembly, and containing organic parts. The amount of energy required to create a destructive beam is several orders of magnitude more than the energy required to launch a physical projectile at high velocity via a mass effect field. Lacking any clear ammunition or fuel source, the device likely uses heat sinks or compensators to maintain firing during sustained combat. Current Cerberus efforts to understand the technology and replicate it have failed. Medigel is a common medicinal salve used by paramedics, EMTs, and military personnel. It combines several useful applications, a local anesthetic, disinfectant, and clotting agent all in one. Once applied, the gel is designed to grip tight to flesh until subjected to a frequency of ultrasound. It is sealable against liquids, most notably blood, as well as contaminants and gases. The gel is a genetically engineered bioplasm created by the CERTA Foundation, a medical technology megacorp based on Earth. Technically, Medigel violates council laws against genetic engineering, but to date, it has proved far too useful to ban. Based on existing technology, the ML-77 is a rapid-fire missile launcher using seeking projectiles. Each projectile features a friend or foe recognition system, ensuring it will find a hostile target even if the user's aim is not completely accurate. The weapon excels at taking out snipers and other entrenched enemies in dense urban environments. This makes it popular with mercenary groups, particularly the Blue Sun's mercenary band. Missile launchers have been appearing with increasing frequency in the Terminus system, but their point of manufacture is unknown. Legal duplication of missile launchers is difficult due to Fabrication Rights Management, FRM, technology.